started. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Caitlin, and I work at Square Books. Uh, before we kind of kick off to the main event, I wanted to do a little bit of Square Books housekeeping and tell you all about some upcoming events. Um, then I'll introduce these two guys you see before you. Um, so next week, or not next week, but April 8th, uh, which is a Thursday, we will be hosting Brittany Morris, uh, who's a YA author. Um, her book is called Co The Cost of Knowing, and um, she'll be in conversation with Mississippi great Angie Thomas, author of The Hate You Give and Concrete Rose. Um, technically for young adults, but I think um, adults could enjoy it too. Um, next, um, on Saturday, we have a matinee event at uh, 1 p.m. April 10th. Uh, well, it's two authors, Kevin Brockmeyer for the Ghost Variations and Karen Tid Tidbeck for the Memory Theater. Um, this is really kind of inventive and thoughtful uh, works of fiction. I'd encourage you to check them out. I think it's gonna be a really dynamic and fascinating conversation. Um, after that, Thursday, April 15th at 5 p.m., we have Martha Hall Kelly. Uh, you probably know her as the author of The Lilac Girl. She's got a new book called Sunflower Sisters. It's a, it follows three women um, uh, during the Civil War, and she'll be joined in conversation with Lisa Wingate, author of um, Before We Were Yours. And okay, last one, and then we'll, we'll kind of keep move on, is uh, next, that Tuesday, April 20th, um, we will be hosting Willie Vlatten for The Night Always Comes, and he's going to be joined in conversation with um, local author and noir wonderkind, uh, Bill Boyle. Uh, I will drop a link to um, our calendar so you can check those out after this, but moving on. Uh, we are here tonight to discuss um, John Archibald's memoir, Shaking the Gates of Hell, uh, a little bit about John. Um, he is the current, current Neiman Fellow at Harvard. He's a columnist for the Alabama Media Group, and his columns appear in the Birmingham News, the Huntsville Times, the Mo Mobile Press Register, AL.com, and its social brand, Reckon. He won a Pulitzer Prize for commentary in 2018 in his book, Shaking the Gates of Hell, published by Knopf, is about his family, civil rights in the South, and the church's role in a conspiracy of silence. He is joined this evening by David McGee. Um, David McGee is the author of a dozen books and the director of Institute Advancement at the University of Mississippi, a role he started after helping create and launch the William McGee Center for Wellness Education at the university, named for his late son. Uh, David's memoir, Dear William, is slated for release in November, and he was previously a vice president at the Alabama Media Group, working closely with John Archibald, whom he considers his most trust, one of, among his most trusted and respected friends. Um, all right, phew. Uh, yeah. All right, guys, uh, I will go away and leave it to y'all. Um, folks, if you would drop your questions in the q and I'll come back later and kind of moderate those. So uh, don't be shy. And um, thank you guys both so much. We're so thank excited you. you're here. Have all fun. right, Happy thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. So the good, the good news is for everybody, I won't have a lot to say in this. This is going to be a fun conversation between two good friends and many other friends who have joined us. I, I do want to just say one thing, though. You know, this, this is an emotional moment for me to hold this book because, you know, John truly is actually at the top of my most tr trusted and respected friends. And we bonded over two great pursuits, trying to save journalism and even help it grow at a time when it was being crashed down and many people thought it was going to be dead. And then out of the office where we worked as colleagues, out of the office, we bonded as in this old men's uh, basketball game that started at the Birmingham YMCA with a very diverse group of people from different backgrounds and ages. And I just want to tell you that John is, is one of the most tenacious humans that I know. And when he covered me in basketball, I never felt the same afterwards, though I, he earned my respect. And John, a lot of people didn't understand if, if journalism would survive when you went through and those Birmingham newspapers were crashed down to three days a week and it was going to go to this digital approach. And 
I was hired right after that. So I got to watch you and you were the hardest working man in the newsroom, even though you were this columnist of, you know, by that time prowess and you were determined not to give it up. And it was lo and behold, you won the Pulitzer Prize. And that's something that I feel like I, we, we all, you, you did that for all of us. Do you still pinch yourself and go, did this really happen? Oh God, yes. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, and uh, I still can't believe it a lot of times, but you know, I mean, th those times when, when you came in and we were still trying to figure out how we were gonna survive and covered local news and cover greater, you know, larger areas and, and things like that. I mean, that really led the way because, um, because it was at that moment in time where it really became clear and, and, and part of it was the young people that were coming up with us who, who didn't have the history in journalism, but had, had an understanding of what it was about. Uh, but they also saw different ways to tell stories. I mean, whether it was podcasts or videos, or we did cartoons, we did uh, we did fairy tales, we did uh, illustrate. My son did a, a illustrated history of Alabama, and it's all those things that made it. You know, it made it fun again. And we stopped saying we stopped looking back, and we started looking forward, and that changed everything for me. And that's why. I mean, that's why everything happened after that. Yeah. Yeah. And John, you really found your writing voice. It was there, but you found a conviction for it kind of when it added this digital world is watching it. And I love this book so much because you, there's a lot of, there's so much in here, the depths of faith and how we family and, you know, how we how we stand by when you know good things happen to bad bad people but also as a writer and i think as we're at square books we should talk about writing style you know you told me once how you, you know you started out with another uh, famous writer in the newsroom there at the birmingham news rick bragg uh, and and how did that impact you and how did you evolve to to really forge that unique john archibald writing style that we see in this great book um you know, it's kind of funny because I mean, when I when I was first coming up, Rick worked at the Birmingham News, and you know, y'all know. I mean, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Rick, but Rick can turn a phrase better than any human being I've ever been around. I mean, uh, say what else you want, and um, and so of course, when I was young coming up, and and he's in there taking three days to write a lead because he just wants it perfect, but when it comes out, it like hits you in the face because you know it's like wow. So, I mean, I wanted to write like Rick, you know, I mean, so, so for the first few years of my life, I, I mean, my journalism life, I was trying to write like Rick. I think a lot of us were um, until one day it just dawned on me that, number one, I'll never be able to write like Rick because nobody can write like Rick. And number two, if I succeeded, I'll be a cheap imitation of Rick at the best case scenario. So I eventually gave that up and 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 started, you know, people are always saying, find your voice, find your voice, like we know what that means, you know, like it's an easy thing to just find your voice. But at some point, I just stopped thinking about it and started listening to that voice in my head that tells me what to think, you know, tells me what to ask or tells me what to do or tells me how to answer this question. And when I started just trusting that voice in my head, not the crazy one, but the <laughs> rational voice, sometimes the crazy one, people people started to respond. And the more confident mm -hmm. I became in that, and the more I realized that, I mean, that's the only thing we have in the whole world that, well, it's one of the only things we have in the whole world that's unique to us. So, so I think when we trust it and use it, uh, we sound a lot more genuine. Yeah, I just love that because I remember early on, you would talk to me about your column and, and you said like, I just believe I've got to be me. And that's one thing we agreed on a lot. That's one thing we agreed on so much. You had a line in your book, John, and, and, and it, those of you who haven't read it yet, I, I can't wait till you can dive in because he does write from this honest place in this voice that is uniquely John's that so many of us love. And you have a, you know, this is a story about your father and we'll relate it to your father very much and we'll get into more of that. But you have a line in here that your father loved a pun as much as your father, a Methodist minister, your father loved a pun as much as he loved a proverb. And I laughed about that, John, because those of us that know you intimately, both, both reading your writing and as a close friend, 
you also love a pun and cast a few of your own proverbs. And so uh, you, you, you obviously inherited something from your father, I would guess. Well, I would think so. And I think my kids got it too. So, um, <laughs> you know, and sometimes I think I included that chapter only so I could get some puns in from that, steal some more puns from my children. But um, yeah, I mean, he did. And they're, you know, I know their dad jokes and they're, uh, they are what they are. But I did read a beautiful article the other day. I wish I could remember who wrote it um, that, that uh, stated uh, scientifically how puns are really. Uh, the basis, the foundation for all sophisticated humor. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to that uh, conclusion. Uh, but I do love a good pun. It, just for anybody, in case you haven't seen it yet, you do have a chapter for all intents and purposes. But yeah, I stole that from my son Ramsey. T e n t s. Now, if anybody has ever found a better chapter name in a book, I, I don't know. I that, haven't that, seen it. That was a quote from my son Ramsey, who. Uh, who he and, my, and Drew, my son, are, they are masters. We, we have a game called, uh, I, I don't remember what it's called, but it's a pun game and he, they beat me like a drum every time. I love it. So, so uh, you know, again, it's Square Books and we have other writers joining us and, you know, it's a community of writing is, you, we've loved you celebrating in um, uh, social media and stuff leading up to this. And uh, I, I personally, as somebody who has been involved a little bit in the publishing process, I have enjoyed, John, watching what, what I would call um, a, 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 an incredibly supportive relationship with your uh, literary agent, Steve Ross. And I, I, he may be with us uh, this evening, I think, and I've seen him on some others. And uh, you know, he's such a, your, your fan and people that write and look at writing other books, talk to me a little bit about that process and what that relationship is meant and, and how you arrive, how y'all arrived at your angle for the book. Oh my God. Um, well, you know, Steve, uh, Steve was everything through this process. I mean, from the, I mean, from the minute, uh, I talked to him about it and what, and, I don't know if you want to get into this later, but I initially figured out I wanted to do this because I found these file cabinets in my basement that had every sermon my dad had ever given. And I started looking at those sermons through important moments in the civil rights movement, um, particularly the month I was born, which was the month that Dr. King was in jail writing the letter excoriating the white church for silence. And when I found this and I found silence um, I was very dis disappointed by that, um, and, I t and I took this to him, and he got it right away, uh, and, uh, and from there, it moved pretty quickly, and, and he was so important to me because, um, you know, there were moments when I got down. I mean, I think we, we had, uh, had interviewed one publisher, and they clearly didn't get it, and so I was a little bit, uh, you know, I was, I was uh, discouraged by that, and uh, I think the most important role he played throughout was to uh, to make me feel uh, like it was worth pursuing and um, and that it was uh, it was a story that needed to be told. And, you know, I mean, and, you know, you probably know about know this about me as well. I mean, if you give me a purpose and a deadline, um, I'm going to put it out there. Uh, and, and he gave me Delicious. He gave me a purpose and a deadline, and uh, he guided me all the way through it. I can't say enough about it, Steve. He's 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 been great. Well, that, that I think that it, that's just such an important lesson because that's such a it, it it that trust to find somebody that believes in your work, and I think for all the jobs we do anywhere, right? I mean, you know, no matter where our ego is or whatever. Look, I mean, it helps to have people believe in us and champion us along the way, and. It's been fun for me to watch that process. And I, I think that is one of the key elements that helps a publisher and the reading public end up with a great book because it allows you to use your writing style and trust it, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I appreciate the, I, pr I appreciate the editor too, at Knopf, who, uh, Victoria Wilson, who, who, you know, when we made the proposal, I, I didn't know how this book was going to end. I didn't know at all how it was going to end. I knew I had a beginning and I knew I wanted to tell a story of my family. And I wrote out this, um, this outline for it. And, uh, and, and she said, and she looked at it and she nodded and she, you know, obviously she bought it, but, um, 
but she said, you know, as, as far as that outline, you know, that last half is, uh, I think that last half is just BS. Uh, <laughs> just, tr just trust your writing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, right. and so that was helpful too. And, and uh, that ultimately, uh, I, I think was really, really good advice. I love that. So I'm interested back more. Let's dig into the book a little bit. And 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 thank you for touching on that earlier about your father in the sermons. And um, did you you will take us through that? I, I've got one friend uh, who I think is with us also, who's Chris McAlilly, and I love him like I love you. And his his father and grandfather were Methodist preachers. And uh, I hope you'll get to meet Chris one day. And uh, but you you've got even generate you're like three generations. But, but to be able to dig into your father's, I mean, you literally went back and began to pull out his sermons and look and, and correlate with what happened in history and what he had to say. And that had to have been both a, a profound moment as a son, but even just for framing history and who were the messenger, messengers to the people in this time, right? Right. And, and, you know, and it's actually more than three generations, I will say. I mean, it's my, on my, my dad's side, it's his, my dad, his dad, his dad. Well, they were all preachers all the way back to 1740. Now, they weren't all Methodist at, before the Civil War, but they were, they go that way. But, but then I got a grandfather on the other side, an uncle, an aunt, and, you know, it goes on. For, I got a niece, uh, you know, and it, it, it's everywhere, like kudzu in the South, right? But um, uh, so, yeah, and you know, and my dad is still and always has been the person I admire and respect the most. I think he's the person I've met with the most principle, the most, uh, the most dedicated. He's the guy who would go in and, you know, when somebody wrote the uh, my sister's phone number on the bathroom wall, he didn't wait around. He just walked in with a can of Lysol and wiped it up, you know, cleaned it up. Or you know, when I get thrown in jail when I was a kid, you know, I tried desperately not to teach, not to tell my parents about it. But here he comes walking into the courtroom when that happens. And, and so, and he taught us about uh, the, the importance of equality, uh, you know, all of these things. Made, he integrated scout troops, made, you know, but, and so I was stunned when I started looking at these dates. I looked at the, I mean, the first one I looked at was that moment I was born when, uh, again, King is in jail excoriating the white church for silence. And my dad is the preacher at Alabaster, you know, Methodist, well, Methodist church at that time. Um, 23 miles from the jail, you know, so, um, so I looked at that week, which was the week of the children's crusade, when thousands of children marching uh, with Dr. King were arrested and taken to jail, and the week after that was Children's Sunday at the Methodist Church, and when I read that sermon, and it had, uh, it had a discussion of, of great problems across the world, you know, horrible, sor sorrowful problems in Africa and Asia and South America and far, far away places, but no mention of, of the huge event that was going on just outside the stained glass windows. Um, it struck me pretty hard. Um, and because it was so easy to look at problems that were far away, uh, but not the ones that we face ourselves. And so I began to look farther and, you know, Selma to Montgomery March Day, 16th Street Baptist Church Day, uh, Bombing Day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the more I looked, the more silence I found. And, uh, and it didn't fit with his personality to me. And so I wanted to, uh, I ended up reading them all, but I wanted to make sure, I mean, I wanted to know why. I mean, what was making him silent? Because I knew it wasn't theology or ideology. And that, that's what really launched this search. And so how does that, you know, how, how, how do you, um, you, you know, a, a, as a son, like today, when you've been through all that, you know, what, 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 how do you make sense of connecting all those dots to here you are as a, as a result of that in the messaging that you spread? You, 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 look, those that are just getting you, learning about John's writing, I mean, you, you, are evan you are an evangelist of a different sort. I mean, you have a calling, is, I think you've said you use a pen, but I mean, you speak for those that don't have a voice. You feel that you have that drive to help, you know, for the unfairness. I mean, you fight that fight for so many people. Yeah, well, I certainly have a pulpit of a sort. It's certainly not a, I mean, a, you know, and that's sort of my theory of uh, the book is that we all have pulpits, uh, secular or religious or 
uh, otherwise, and they might be a, at large and they might be a, around a dinner table, but they exist and, and we need to use them. But I mean, the whole book I think is, the goal of the book is to try to figure that out and try to reconcile that and, and how to do it. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, I don't know that we ever come to an answer and we not, certainly can't um, go back in time with any degree of certainty and know how we would behave in, as adults in 1960 or 1950 or 1970, whatever. We can't know how we would do that. Um, so it's not an attempt to go back and say, look how bad this was. It's an attempt to say, if the person that I most respect in the world has flaws, um, maybe that makes it easier for me to understand the flaws of myself. And it might make right. me understand how to react today in a situation that is very similar in some ways about this issue or that issue or whatever issue becomes important at that moment. And uh, so that's, I mean, people, people often say it's a book about my dad, um, but I really, I really see it as a book that's told through my dad that's about, um, and then the rest of my family, um, that's about us. And, uh, yeah. and that's, that's where I hope it, it is understood. It's well, it's a can't put down story and it, it, it has so much, you know, when you really write a great book, particularly in a memoir, you know, people that seemingly come from slightly different backgrounds, Mississippi or Ohio, not Alabama or a different faith or whatever. Uh, this, this is all of our book. And we all we all relate to this because it, it has so much about growing up and dealing with the change around us and the conflicts and how do we make sense of it and who are we today and what do we stand up for? And you, you, you make such a powerful uh, testament to that in voice. And, uh, you know, it, it, I have a son, one of my favorite chapters, I have a son who, uh, my son Hudson, who I, I call him like my role model. And he, he a, a big piece of his life has been uh, fly fishing. I think it, it I, I, I've told him before, that's what made you a man really, it, it, beyond other things like faith, it, it really helped shape him. I love as you're talking about the, the the fly fishing imagery and your father teaching and le mentoring. Th that's very powerful stuff. Uh, do you still fly fish any? And tell me a little bit about your father's convictions of that. Yeah, uh, I ha you know I haven't fly fished in a couple of years, and I really really miss it because it's the place that I, uh, I have always felt more, most at peace, and and it's certainly the place where I had the most. Uh, unspoken i mean words weren't necessary when i was fly fishing with my dad of course you know there is that story about where i stuck that fly in the back of his head and couldn't get it out but uh that's a that's another thing um but you know and it sort of became i i, I just i love it so much and and it's not like we didn't we didn't fly fish of the style from you know a river runs through it or oh our, yeah no i guess kind of, we were on a lake in a canoe on the early morning hours fishing for bass and brim in the lake which is easier but it's a lot of fun and um uh but you know i, I came to also see it as a metaphor you know as i'm as i'm trying to figure out you know you know i want to hold my dad accountable but i want to show the fullness of him I want to show that he is way more than this and why it sort of surprised me in the first place, uh, which we, we do deal with in the book quite a bit. But, um, but, you know, I came to think of it, you know, as in terms of fly fishing, I mean, you know, I want, you know, I want, I want to, maybe I want to go out and throw some dynamite in the pond and, uh, and, and see how many fish I can get, but he's got the fly rod, you know, over the water, back and forth, back and forth, hoping to lure somebody in. Um, and, you know, and so I have to question, uh, you know, whose way is better, his way or my way, because we all know that you can't uh, berate somebody into agreeing with you. You can't call somebody an idiot and make them come to your side. So, um, you know, maybe the skill of, of putting that fly over the water just so, dropping it just so in, that leads them to, to, to bite. Um, so that, that debate goes on. John, you just hit on something that, so having been working with you side by side as a colleague, I, I, I know intimately your writing style and, you know, how you really worked hard to not 
hit people over the head with a hammer. Sometimes you might lament a little more about things you don't like. And um, there's there as you talked about that, I see it. I see your writing style. I see the cadence in that, and it makes all the sense. Well, and, and, and you know that comes with evolution as well because. Uh, because I did learn, I mean, you know, and language changes, you know, I think about the way I wrote in 2004 when I first started this or 2008, uh, and I would have been way more snarky in that environment than I am today, but we're in a world overrun with snark. We're in a world overrun with people beating each other over the head with words. And um, I've sort of lost a taste for it, you know, and I think a lot of people have. And uh, I think it's a lot more effective to just be genuine and come from the heart and recognize the good and acknowledge the bad, uh, and and to uh, and, and how those things can coexist. Not and you know and how the you know how we deal with that. If that makes I, sense. I think that is absolutely your power as a writer, and I uh, about topics that are often so sensitive and being the voice of the every man and every woman, and that that is so powerful. I love that. You know, one thing uh, I, I, I want to say before we run out of time, I, I got to tell you, like, I, I witnessed this. The audience, I hope I can do justice to this. There's a moment probably two years before John wins the Pulitzer, okay? And we all go through work stress, life stress, and the world's changing on you. And we, we've all been through moments like this. How am, it, should I walk away? Is this right for me? And, and, and John and I are talking one day, and I do think it was 2016 probably. And, you know, he, he's like, I'm just, I'm burnt out. I'm at this spot. I, I don't know. And we, we, we come up with this crazy idea and he's a part of this. And we're just talking like we are here, but we're standing this close together in an office. And we come up with this idea to do this in month of July, John's going to take off across the state of Alabama and do Archibald Does Alabama. He's going to have to wake up different days, go drive to different places of the state. He's going to use video. He's going to use social. He's going to write columns, a myriad of, of multimedia tools. And, and John was the most seasoned uh, veteran award-winning person in the entire root newsroom, more than a hundred and something journalists. And, 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 and almost nobody would take that assignment. Your wife, Alicia, I remember going, John, that sounds a little crazy. Uh, that's a little, sounds difficult. I have to tell you guys, John Archibald, th there was no dreams of Pulitzer. People talk about writing this, to get to this book from a publisher of this magnitude and tell this great important story doesn't happen easily. John, you did that and you went out about the state and you were the hardest working man and person in the newsroom. And that seemed like to me a pivotal pivotal moment in your writing career that 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 kind of got you charging forward. Well, you know, it, it, that was a. Um, I was so sick of politics right then. I, I mean, I was it, it was sixteen, I, I, I guess, and but you know, and you know, it, maybe it wasn't even as intense as it is now, but it was so intense that it was just everybody hated everybody and everything, nobody was listening to anybody, reason didn't count. And so we, as we talked about it, I, just, I, I, I wanted to get out and see people because when I get out and see people is when I can see the humanity in people. You can't see the humanity in people when you are reading social media all day long, you just can't. And, um, and I have this philosophy, which is the reason we settled on this, I think is that everybody has a story if you're willing to talk to them. And so we, the weird, the crazy thing about that is we went to, I went to 31 different cities and 31 different days and wrote 31 different stories from people we didn't know we were going to talk to, just trusting that we would find somebody that would talk to me and, and tell a story. And, and, you know, I, I, I you talked me into it and I thought you were crazy in some ways, but <laughs> And it um, was 2015, and you knew it wasn't. It wasn't 2016. I put the wrong year in your head. It was 2015. Yeah. But well, either way, it all well, runs I together. Did, I, I, I don't know if I talked you into it, but you were tenacious enough to do it, John. And, and it it was amazing work. 
it was amazing. It ended up that we got a good story. I, I think just about every day was a good story, which was crazy. Yes. And it was, it was and, just and, 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 Although my knees have never forgiven me for that whole I trip. mean, folks, he slept like in the car, a tent. I, I don't even, campsites. But, but, but then, you know, just two and a half years later, you're winning the big prize and you're doing this. And I say that, and I know we're almost out of time, but I say that because people in writing, I, I actually am looking right out the window at my friend Kiese Lehman's house and, you know, a writer we both uh, adore and uh, respect so much. And, you know, he's taught me a lot about the hard work of writing and it doesn't come easily. And, and you were a testament to that. So on that note, as a, as a kind of a last question before we move into some questions from the audience, um, John, you know, you've been doing this deal up at Harvard, this Neiman Fellowship, and I'm so excited for you with that. You took the time to write the book. Are we going to get to see that column coming back soon, A, and B, what do we have to do to get you to come do 30 days around Mississippi and tell us something about ourselves? That, that would be fun. I, I am going to go back and write columns. Uh, and uh, and I really want to expand it across the South because I think I think that's the next logical step. And um, I would love to come to Mississippi and do that. And maybe not uh, 31 and 31. <laughs> not in a tent for 31 days, I get it. Yeah, uh, I'll pick February, we'll do 28 and 28. Yeah, yeah, they got a great hotel in Greenwood. There's other ones throughout the state, you'll be fine. <laughs> well, anytime I can get up to go to Square Books, it'll be okay, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And we'd love to get for some question to some questions. And yeah, uh, I know there's some, uh, we've already had some in chat. Uh, Caitlin, we'll check into you for some questions. Yeah, yeah, we've got some great questions. If uh, anyone has any more, uh, now's the time, ask them. Uh, okay, so Steve would like to know, um, there's so much love for your family that shines through in the book. And did you ever pause or worry about how they might respond to the <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah um well i mean you know because uh, i mean it, it, the, my family is very close and we've always been very close i mean it's crazy close i mean we have four kids and we've all showed we you know until my parents were dead we all showed up every christmas wherever we were living across the country mm -hmm. to spend christmas together for every year of our lives and uh you know and it was a big important thing to us and everything about my family is important and um and so, you know, when I first started saying, you know, I'm disturbed by what I'm not finding, um, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I think uh, may have uh, sent some shivers uh, down the, the spines of my siblings. Um, but I wanted to make sure, so I wrote it. I mean, when I wrote it, I, I mean, I knew, uh, you know, that, uh, that I want that, I did. I didn't. I would rather not alienate my family than to write the book I wanted to write. To be honest with you, it's probably sacrilege and the writers uh, speak. So I sent it off to them beforehand, and um, and uh, you know I've been really um, appreciative of the response. And and I think I mean the book. To be clear to people, I mean because it because the you know the the concept of the book is you know I'm looking to see what my father said. But it's also really runs on a theme of love and disappointment. You know, as, as King said in that letter, I keep quoting, you know, you can't have great disappointment without great love. Um, and he was referring to the church. And I, and I feel like that carries through to my father and my family and all of us, you know, and if you only feel disappointed if, if, if you have that love. And so I think that most people who have read it have really, certainly those in my family have, uh, have recognized the love and the and 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 the and I think and we tend to agree that my father would appreciate the message and uh, and so that makes it a lot easier for me to to, to smile about it. And, and John, uh, could you just touch briefly on your brother Murray? Your your father, I'm so struck. What was the year? 1974 or something? Your your brother is coming. Your your father showed just profound support at a time when that wasn't happening so much much less to be a man of faith in on in on the job yeah my dad was pre uh, was preacher at first united methodist church of decatur alabama uh in 1974 and my brother uh, murray came out uh as gay in the 70s which was a different time than we are living in right now of course uh which would have created a lot more uh 
uh, furor, and um, and there was, uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, it was, I mean, it, it was. I don't think it was a surprise to anybody. I mean, Murray came out before I knew what gay was, so you know, it was, it wasn't a surprise. But there was never a moment in um, in my dad's uh, existence in which he doubted his love for his son. Um, and so he, uh, while it took him a while, I think, to fully be able to talk about that, you know, in a, in a public way, certainly in the church, um, he, uh, he never hesitated in that. And, and when, uh, my, my, when Murray brought um, uh, his partner, Steve Elkins, home in the, in the 70s, and they were together for 35 years until Steve died, um, the first thing my dad did was invite him to church, you know, and so, uh, you know, which is, you know, is, 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 you know, he, he, I mean, not because he wanted to do anything other than to welcome him as he would welcome anybody else. And, um, and all of that stuck, you know, and, uh, and that's why I wanted to write that part of the book. I mean, because in, in so many ways, a lot of the language that's been, that was used uh, to uh, justify uh, segregation is also being used in the church by the same sort of officials to 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 uh, justify um, uh, uh, um, mistreatment against uh, gay and lesbian people, and the language is so starkly similar. It's it's interesting, but you know that that's that's one of those things that was so surprising about my dad because he was such a person of 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 unconditional love. And he, in that, and, and he applied that to us definitely, but he applied that to other people too. So it didn't make sense when, uh, when it started, when I started finding that silence and that exported. And we haven't really talked about that, but there was certainly a, a lot of pressure to remain silent. Sure. Um, so the, the next question um, is from Terry Truncale. Terry, I'm sorry if I got your last that name. That would be Tr Terry Truncale. Troncale. Uh, okay. Um, Terry asks, um, I think writing a regular column is one of the hardest things to do well, and you do it very well. But which was harder, writing the book or your column? Oh, you know, Terry, it depends on what day that is on the column. Some days, some days they flow out like you uh, know what you're doing, and some days you lie in bed all night trying to figure out why you can't think of anything. Um, but the strangest thing about this book is that I've never written anything, um, I hate to say easier, um, but from the moment that I, you know, I mean, Terry, I know you know, and any journalist knows this feeling you get, like when you're looking for a document or something, and all of a sudden you find the thing that makes everything make sense, and there's this shiver that runs up and down your spine, and you know I've got it. And from there on in, everything is at least easy to see. And the more I read, I mean, the more I read, the, the silence part of it was huge. But in the, in the use of parable as a, an, as a way to try to get around it, it wasn't quite enough. I mean, it, it just made sense. And so it all poured out uh, in a way that, um, that I can't explain other than it had to come out and that sounds cliche and uh, sappy or stupid uh, or whatever, but, but it, it happened. And I told Steve, my agent, I told Steve uh, that uh, I can write this book in three months. And, and Steve correctly laughed at me, not, not because he doubted me, but he said, if we tell that to the publishers, they'll think you're crazy. <laughs> and they would. Um, but it, I took three months and it poured out and the book is uh, largely the same book. So, wow. so it was, it was, it was, it was magical to me. Um, that, that actually kind of segues into, well, into this next question, which I think you, you mostly answered, but um, um, so Carla Jean would like to know, um, more about the writing process. She thinks that you took a sabbatical. So were you able to complete most of the writing? Um, yeah, I took three months. And um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I did, I finished it all. <laughs> and I just, but you know, I mean, I, 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 that's what happens, like Terry was talking about, when you write a column three times a week, at least, 
um, you get used to having to write on demand and whether you get used to having to write, whether you got it or not. I mean, you, you, if, when there's a space waiting to fill in the paper and they're expecting it to come, it has to come. And, um, and so usually the, uh, the answer to that is to sit down and write things. And if you don't know what you're gonna say when you start, you know what you need to say by the time you finish and then you can start over and do it correctly. Um, but I would get up every morning um, and write and I would go walk in the afternoon and think about it tomorrow. Um, and, uh, and in that way, uh, I, was, I was pretty much able to, to write a chapter a day and then the next day go back and fix it. And um, I wish I could, I just hope I can capture that in a bottle again sometime, you know, cause it was, it was some of the most fun writing I've ever had. And I gotta say my, uh, every time I would do that, my wife, Alicia and my son, Drew, my oldest son, um, they were, there's a dedication in the book. It says to fire and brimstone, which a lot of people have misunderstood, but fire is Alicia and a brimstone is Drew. And they edited it harshly uh, at first. And, uh, and that was invaluable. And uh, they're great editors. It's nice to have that, that in-house team. It is. Um, Okay, um, so these next two are kind of biggies. Um, uh -oh. so to save biggies. them for last, but um, I so like Teresa, big questions. yeah, they, they're both really great. Um, Teresa would like to know: uh, Has there been comment or response from the Methodist Church? I know we were kind of talking earlier about an event you did. Yeah, I, did. I was trying to remember if we were talking before the this began or not, but. Um, one of the first events we did was held at a large Methodist church in Birmingham, which uh, was ironically where, uh, where segregationists within the church met in the 60s, um, but has become uh, quite a bit more progressive. But th there were huge numbers of, of Methodist preachers there, many of them contemporaries of my dad. Um, and so I was a little bit worried about about going there because I mean obviously they would be facing the same things my dad did obviously they knew him and they knew the difficulties of the times and and I was concerned about how they would feel some of his some of the people who worked with my dad directly were there too and who were concerned going in as to what I might be saying uh, but I've heard from quite a few of them I mean I guess it it stands to reason that I would not hear necessarily from those who hated it but um the uh the number of people who've called and said, you know, have said, you know, I, I didn't expect to like this, but I didn't know what it was, um, was, was great. And they, you know, and thank me for writing it, which uh, makes me feel good, which, you know, I was not necessarily expecting. I'm sure that's not the full view of it, because if I, you know, if I don't make somebody mad, I'm probably not really doing a good job. I mean, I've always believed that. I mean, why write a book if you want everybody to like it? Um, so, I mean, that's that's a that's form that that's philosophy formed from column writing, no doubt. But um, I, so far, I mean, the Methodist News Service did a, a thing on it, which was okay, you know. So, I mean, I think that um, I think that people who read it so far, anyway, have understood um, that it's not exactly as we're able to describe it because it is kind of complicated and it deals more with justice quest but um but i've been really really gratified by it yeah um thank you so mm -hmm. this next one i'm going to kind of combine together because i think you can kind of i don't know answer them both so hank would like to know um so why the silence um, in that uh, Hank also heard that same silence um, in the white Southern Baptist church and Joseph kind of adds um, first he looks forward to reading your book. Thank you. And he says that um, a Methodist Bishop who started his career as a pastor in the late fifties told him a few years ago that um, many white Methodist ministers of that era asked themselves did I do what I should have done in response to the civil rights movement and um, how do you think your dad would have answered that question. So 
They're such great questions. And it was a really big one. But. Yeah. And there's a lot of the answers are in, in the book. I'm going to try to get to many of them, but I, I'll forget some. But, you know, as a, uh, there's, there's a, professor, a college professor named Bill Nicholas who, who has studied this a lot and talks about uh, the conspiracy of this, of silence that existed within the churches and beyond the churches and, you know, boardrooms, et cetera, et cetera. But since we're talking about churches and the churches, and it, it was certainly in the Methodist church, but it was in all the churches, uh, which is why uh, Dr. King wrote that letter in the first place in response to the clergy who, uh, who wanted him to delay and delay and delay. And he was saying, you know, I expected better from you guys. Um, but uh, time after time, when I would talk to contemporaries of his, uh, met preachers in, in, in the Methodist church, particularly in, the, in Alabama, um, they would tell me that, uh, you know, uh, as Nicholas said, uh, one, he quoted one uh, who had said, you know, if I, t if I preach about race today, I'll be looking for a church tomorrow. And, um, and many told me that uh, they had been relegated to smaller churches for the rest of their career because, uh, or at least good portions of it, um, because uh, it, was dis it was really discouraged in the, in the early 60s to talk about what they called the race question. Some were uh, put on a list uh, that were not, not would not so they would not be accepted at larger congregations. Some were sent to New England. Some were uh, had to leave the ministry altogether. Um, but my favorite one, you know, a lot, there were a lot of crosses burned in people's yards, and there were a lot. There was a lot of fear. Um, and you know, one of the um, and I'm answering this very long, but I intend to answer it long. I'm sorry. You're um, doing there, great. One, there's one who just speaks to me so much. His name is Ennis Sellers. And he had been writing to me. I mean, he, he read my columns in the Mobile Press Register. And, uh, and he had started to write, to correspond with me a little bit about, you know, he went to Emory with my dad for theology school and all this and, and, and uh, considered him a real good friend and all that at the time. And, uh, but he was saying, you know, he had, he had preached about race and his, his, and he had gotten in some trouble for it. And he had been put on this list of undesirables because of it. Um, but he had also taken a shotgun down to the Waffle House or whatever and told a Klansman if he ever came by and burned a, a cross in his yard, he'd shoot first and take his chances in court. But he, uh, but he said, you know, uh, and I got this note from him, not from, I mean, I got this note from his wife. It was just a few years ago. And uh, he was, she was saying, um, uh, it was one of the most touching things I've ever seen because it started in this bold handwriting, you know, it's talked about Enos's, you know, near death right now. Um, and then the ink changed and it was a little bit more fragile and said, he just, he died today. Cause so she stopped in the middle of the note and he died. And, um, but she wrote that, you know, I, 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 uh, how he he appreciated you know what was said and she sent me uh and, and you know he thought my dad would be proud of me and and, and these sorts of things and and it just uh, it really got to me but he but he also sent me this uh unpublished work he had written about his life and it said yes i was put on that list of of undesirable preachers um, and I was kept at small churches my whole career, but when I got the call to preach, I did not get a call to preach at large churches. I got a pre, so I'm happy that I was able to say what I could say at, to a small congregation or not. It's, uh, it's what I was called to do. And of all the people, you know, I talked to, that's what I wanted to hear. I mean, that's what I needed to hear. And, sure. um, and not what I heard from most of them. I'm going on, I know it's long, but I want to say this. Um, so <laughs> time after time after time, the uh, the preachers would say, you know, they, I love my, I love your dad. You know, they'd say, I love your dad. They inevitably did, and I do too. And, um, but they'd say, you know, he was, he was doing it so, because in the Methodist church, you, if you behave yourself and don't make waves and do a good job, you rise to bigger and bigger churches. 
and he was, they'd say, you know, you, he's doing it for you, you know, so y'all can have a better life and you can have a better parsonage and home and you could live in nicer neighborhoods and you could, he'd have a more salary. He's, he's, um, he's looking after his family, which, which is absolutely true, but it doesn't make me feel any better because, um, because that makes me a part of it. <laughs> and, and like, and I benefited from every bit of it. And I loved every bit of it. And I wished, you know, and I wanted him to, you know, do it all. Um, but it just, you know, it's important to, especially in the context of all the real sacrifice that, that was made by so many people from John Lewis on that bridge or Fred Shuttlesworth getting beat up and, you know, in, in Birmingham or bombed and, and all these things. And, and you have to see it in that context. Yeah. I think you did a great job answering. Um a couple really big questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, we are about out of time. Um, sorry, we couldn't quite get to everyone's, but I think you did a good job kind of touching on the even ones that we couldn't get to. Um, but I just want to show y'all one more time, uh, Shaking the Gates of Hell. We've got signed book plate editions, um, really good looking book plates from Knopf. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think this book is really pretty special because they're so, um, you know, and, and rightly so, so many kind of memoirs and histories of the civil rights movement, but um, not quite as many as kind of that, that next generation and kind of reckoning with, you know, the folks who, who, who weren't active participants and didn't quite do all, you know, the right stuff. And I don't know, I think that's like an important perspective and I'm, I'm glad that you shared it with us and I'm excited to share it with um, our, our readers who couldn't join us tonight um, and David thank you so much for being such um, a warm and gregarious host yes. um, really appreciate both of y'all's time truly thank you so much thank you um, thank you yeah um, y'all have a great night thanks everybody for coming those were um, great questions and um, be sure to get your copy all right thank you well, have a good night thanks